Where are you at? My UFO experience happened when I was in the military in uh, 1988. Where are you at? Me and another guy, we were on patrol. I was in the U.S. Air Force at that time. And, um, where are you at? We were on patrol in Panama. Panama City, Panama. We were in Central America. And uh, we was on patrol and we seen... Uh, this uh, object in the sky. I think that the testimony is rich and loaded in additional hidden language that manifests through this procedure that we detected additional insight into the testimony of this UFO witness. There is additional testimony that tell, appears to me to tell a story of perceptions of extraterrestrials, perceptions of, of uh, perceptions of symbols. Hello everyone and welcome to the Cosmos Connection on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. And today, I am your host, Janet Kerr Lesson, with my co-host, Dr. Sasha Alex Lesson, and our producer is Thomas Becker, also known as a mad painter. Today, we interview John Kelly, who is an international clinician and world-famous speech analyst who released key intelligence pertaining to the Iraq War two years in advance of the shock and awe strikes against Baghdad in 2003. As a former feature producer for CBS Radio with experience in number one rated U.S. television, his work exploring consciousness, communications, the paranormal, and UFO phenomena had been featured in Huffington Post, USA Today, Dallas Morning News, Florida Today, Wall Street Journal, Irish Independent, UC Irvine Today, Coast to Coast AM, Fox News, CBS Radio and Television, CBC, BBC London, <laughs> Deutschland Radio, Berlin, AOL News, UFO Digus, and Forbes.com. I had to get all that out. <laughs> so today we are going to talk about, well, everything, but uh, I, I put a page up on AquarianRadio.com about John. John and, and uh, I have been trying to connect for a couple of years, so now we're finally getting him on our show. We're going to have him on one of our other shows as well in a couple of weeks. But his, um, I guess, is a documentary called UFO Hotline, Secret Messages of the Contactees. And John's going to tell us all about it, but it's dealing with um, callers to the UFO hotline have questions about their lives as witnesses, experiencers of UFO contact pioneering along front lines or expanding consciousness and human performance and um, John Kelly hopes that an extremely psychoactive non-invasive procedure will help as he attempts to learn more about cognitive processes that accompany contact including the emotions and dreams of the contactees viewers rapidly enter the psychic world of UFO experiencers by listening to digital reflections of callers unconscious sleep talking like gestures facilitated by a knowledgeable and friendly expert with nearly 20 years of professional experience boy John I'd like to meet you in person I am a lifelong contactee experiencer and I've been working with Dr. Lesson for the last 20 years but it's always good to get a different perspective before I pull you on let Dr. Lesson Sasha, say something. Take it away, sweetheart. Something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, I, something else. <laughs> okay. So you know, listen, John. My, my friend uh, Stuart Sword though says that when the when the uh, troops went into I, Iraq, one of the first things they hit in this. Uh, time that you were studying was the Iraqi museum. They went to specific drawers and took specific things. And with Stewart, who was once a top Montauk operative before he uh, turned to the light, so to speak, uh, sa says is that this is there was a means of manipulating the portal uh, to, from Nibiru to from Nibiru and Earth. And it was right there in the uh, in, uh, in Iraq, and that's what the Iraq war was really about at the deep state level. And I just wonder what your speculation is in response to Stewart's ideas. 
All right, so let's uh, first, so let's pause that. We're going to ask that again later. But let's start with John. <laughs> Sasha likes to dive into the deep end of the water. Let's start with baby steps, and we'll get to that. That's a very good question. We'll ask that again later. But, John, welcome to the Cosmos Connection. Thank you very much. It's great to be here with both of you. Yes, we're excited to talk to you today. So go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself and your work. I know you do so many things. Um, we definitely want to uh, what do you want to call it? focus on the UFO hotline and contactees because I'm one of them and that really uh, interests me. But go ahead and start where you feel moved to start and then we'll continue down this deep uh, rabbit hole <laughs> going deeper and deeper. Sure. Take it away. Well, I, I've someone who's uh, been in uh, the public arena talking about consciousness and communications issues for the past 20 years. I'm a former CBS radio feature producer. My work has been featured on U.S. television and uh, international broadcasts, as you mentioned. Many, many uh, people have talked to me over the years about what I'm doing as, as a private clinician offering alternative therapeutic services. My website is yourinnervoice.com. And of course, that alludes to the notion that all of us, as I'm sure you're well aware, all of us have this inner voice quality. All of us have an intuition or a conscience that speaks to us in various ways. The, the particular studies that uh, I followed that, uh, that appear to objectify this characteristic are studies of human communications, of, of the human voice, where we use digital samples of people's speech and filter those samples in ways uh, using the equivalent of, a, of an audio mirror. And we study the reflections of those samples and in the reflections we're able to discern the archetypes of the deep unconscious mind. My, my uh, work as a clinician has been vetted by professionals in, in mental health, including psychiatrists, uh, surgeons, and PhD psychologists. And the, the, the conclusions that they reach from, from working with me was that the findings and the procedure was extremely psychoactive. So uh, I, 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 w I found this very compelling, these studies of speech communications and the unconscious, uh, sleep talking like communications. And uh, my clients uh, over the years have received tremendous benefit because as a short term intervention, these the style of communications that we appear to, all of us appear to be engaged in, all of us speakers and talkers appear to be engaged in, the style of communications appears to bypass what could be described as the sensor mechanism of the ego. Uh, and that sensor mechanism uh, comes into play it, 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 quite naturally, you know, uh, as, as primal entities, uh, when we encounter each other, Socially, there are different kinds of cues and subtle interactions that inform us in the first moments of our meeting. You know, people say things like uh, how we, our appearance, uh, make, uh, or that people judge us or make decisions about us based on our first impressions of our appearance, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. And so these different kinds of cues uh, are, are understood, and, and one of the cues that, that, that most interests me or intrigues me is, is these sleep talking like messages encrypted backwards in human speech. And these are detectable using digital filtering technology on a digital audio workstation that's sampling technology that's been in existence for 30 plus years. So I'm, I'm using a, mm -hmm. a computer workstation to run a digital audio editing workstation application and I'm, I'm filtering human speech to detect uh, mirror encrypted messages which appear to describe John, the contents of the unconscious mind. I just, uh, just have to understand this. Is is the same thing that a person's saying uh, out loud? Is his shadow saying the opposite inside of him? Is it the opposite? Well, there's no formula uh, related to what you're describing. Um, it's not, in other words, uh, that to, to generalize in such a way would, would be to diminish the potential of original communications that may occur in each moment between each individual speaker and listener. In other words, human speech, in my experience, is, is spontaneous. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily follow a, um, a formulaic template that could be so easily described. Uh, we really, in other words, to, to learn what a person may be saying, we have to engage with that speaker. We have to actually engage with the person themselves. You know, in, in, for, for example, today, we're in an interview 
uh, venue. Uh, I, I'm the subject of an interview, and by engaging with me through speaking and listening, uh, unique and original statements may emerge that we none of us may have been able to predict beforehand. Mm -hmm. So this, this spontaneity oh. is, is certainly a characteristic of my work. The unexpected is a characteristic of my findings. Uh, and, you know, the, it's, the predictability is, is very vague. Uh, you know, in terms of numbers, I could say that I've, I've demonstrated in the past that with a one-minute sample, I could find a, a verifiable fact in that sample with five minutes of study and, and have the speaker vet my finding and... and, and uh, state its veracity. So in every wow. minute of speech, for, I, I, I'm saying that, that that demonstration that was repeatable uh, mm -hmm. gives, gives the idea that uh, in every minute there's like a burst mode communication, an extra message in human speech that can be detected. Now, again, this hasn't been really you know, thoroughly vetted other than just live demonstrations, on-air demonstrations, or on-camera demonstrations, but uh, I, I, I think what I'm really emphasizing is that there's these communications are, are existent or transmit in a, what's called a burst mode, which is an idea mm -hmm. that's understood by people who work in fields like radio communications. Uh, the, these are not con continuous and, and contiguous, but rather they, they're burst-like. And so through careful monitoring, as I said in, in, in that uh, example of that one-minute sample, uh, there, there would be an instance where there would be something that at least I as the listener could resolve, and I could return to the speaker and say, these are my findings, and the speaker would say, uh, what you have reported are, is in fact uh, a, tr a truthful statement of, of something, at, of, of course, that I would probably have no knowledge about and the speaker would, would explain further to me. Uh, I have a question. Wow. I have a question. This is, this is fascinating. Yeah. I was just reading um, an article the other day about the, the subtle racism in communication. So you have your initial contact and then where you where you go from there. It's, it's like we're always posturing and trying to figure out friend, foe, you know, alliances, uh, differences, uh, where do we fit, where are we in relationship to each other. So there's that aspect. But one of the things as a contactee experiencer, and uh, I, I'm a lifelong experiencer from the crib and I'm 63, continuous um, contact, is I'm starting to um, read minds. But what I think is happening is that I'm, I'm interpreting the burst of information that subtle information that's simultaneously going on with the the upfront verbal communication and I'm getting additional information and then I can verify it sometimes sometimes it's too embarrassing and I don't verify it because it's like I know what they're thinking and I don't want to confront them anyway I just wanted to put that out there because uh, there's something going on and I'm not the only contactee experiencer that is having an additional level of uh, communication and we're going I'm reading minds if I'm What's going on with my uh, psychic abilities? What do you want to say? Something? Oh, just when I was uh, training for NLP, one of the things we do is we breathe exactly as the pers other person is breathing. If we want to show more interest without seeming to direct anything, we sit a little further forward. Now that we've got them entrained with our breath, we change ours faster if we want them to speed up or slower and stuff like that. I, I don't know if that, uh, that would certainly uh, alter the rhythm. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if those things would be encoded but if that's a deliberate attempt can you imagine how many things are going on unconsciously it's like you've opened this whole encyclopedia <laughs> well absolutely you know in, in in today's science news scientists are reporting that the brain is capable of spontaneously constructing 11 dimensional constructs 11 dimensional constructs in, in its normal functioning the brain is functioning in 11 dimensions at the same time. Neurological networks are being constructed and deconstructed in real time. This is in today's science news. And so this discussion, wow. this discussion of the topic that I bring uh, only uh, explores two dimensions. When science is ready to consider 11 dimensions, I, I'm, my, my topic is much more conservative. We only need two dimensions to make you know, what I'm talking about. <laughs> wow. And so for contactees and perceptions, as Janet has spoken about, inner perceptions of uh, alternate flows of information, 
that accompany real-time experience. What I understood Janet was saying was that when she's listening to people in day-to-day -day conversation, that she's having perceptions of additional insight that accompany that, which may yes. be auditory cues, or they may be visual cues, uh, and I'm saying inner, inner vision or inner hearing, rather, rather than necessarily uh, you know, what that person is wearing, et cetera, uh, or, or feelings. Yes. So these, uh, this functionality is something that, uh, for, for the most sensitive people, then calls upon resources for managing that functionality because we could, we could envision that a heavy equipment operator might be moving a, you know, a significant load of materials in a crowded s space, and and uh, and when spontaneously, you know, 15 dimensions of information occur to them, they may have trouble operating that equipment under those conditions. It may be difficult, to, in other words, for normal functionality. Uh, you know, the naturalness of our experience may be influenced by such a dense. A compound of information. My, my understanding of of perception and sensing, uh, if I if I'm correct, I, my readings have shown me that the brain does a lot of filtering. That the physical senses mm -hmm. are in taking all these different wavelengths of information. We know that there's a, there's all these different spectra and frequencies uh, that are permeating our environment, x-rays, mm -hmm. ultraviolet rays, et cetera. But the, the, the human eye may intake those wavelengths, but the brain will uh, subtractively filter the input so that only the visible spectrum, what we call the visible spectrum of light, is, is what the brain will deal with. And this may relate directly to concepts, as, I, as I've stated, it may deal with, con or d relate to concepts of manageability, that we may be, it may be more natural or more functional for us to, uh, to, to only have to deal with the visible light spectra rather than entities in the infrared world and entities in the, uh, the microwave world. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So this yeah, is and I, but I just want to see, I understand, uh, like an, in an in theogenic uh, experience that I had, I, I remember seeing, God, everything seems to be wavy. Uh, it's like I'm looking through water, a bubble float, is float. My gosh, there is water. There's water on my eyes. I've always been looking through water. And then I looked further and I saw these it look like molecules and so forth. And so that it's, it's all there, but I filtered it all out except for when the entheogen was letting me uh, cleanse the doors of my perception, so to speak. Absolutely. So the entheogenic experience or the mind manifesting experience uh, is populated with with perceptions of multiple dimensions and and pop and, and and the populations who reside within those dimensions and the interactions with those populations and the you know the uh, transactions of information between dimensions and and it, it it informs us of what the the classical literature of ancient societies may have been describing when in the Greek mythology the uh, the the the, uh, the journey of Odysseus is accompanied mm -hmm. by encounters with uh, you know, legendary and mythical creatures and entities and magical displays, et cetera. Or mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the Mahabharat of India, the, the interactions between the Gandharvas and the people of those times, and even the, 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 the interdimensional warfare between the peoples of those times mm -hmm. is described in the literature. And so the, the, the pioneers of today uh, who have taken, you know, who have risen to the call of the entheogenic experience are perhaps, you know, revisiting the classical pathways of, of some of the, the great genius intelligence of our, you know, of, of our early history, both in the West and in, uh, in other cultures, uh, you know, the, the diverse indigenous cultures are spread throughout the world. Right on. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they talk about uh, uh, Plato, uh, Aristotle, and those guys. Basically, when they're ready for their passage to manhood, they went into a a, a cave so where they were surrounded by mirrors, and they had ergotamine, the uh, stuff that was growing on a rye plant. We uh, we've had lysergic acid diethylidamide in it and so they got to see their many selves and reflect and that was all just part of their rite of passage into uh, I guess wisdomhood. Yeah, and I want to go back 
one, to one thing, and then I'll pass the, the talking stick back to you, John, is that you mentioned the 11 dimensions. A lot of experience, not a lot, but some that I've interviewed and talked to, and I have a lot of personal conversations because we're all trying to figure it out and connect the dots, but people are becoming aware of their multidimensional selves right. and the, their existence simultaneously in many timelines, many uh, dimensions, many vibratory frequencies. And that's one of the things that's coming through to me in my dreams is that I am simultaneously living out lives on the 11 dimensions and so it could be endless actually <laughs> but um anyway i just wanted to put that out there what do you think of that well i i think that your testimony speaks to uh the population that is uh on this cutting edge of experience whose experience uh, overtakes uh the conventions of the mainstream culture in other words our mainstream culture and our representations of life that inform us, you know, from, from our grade school experiences and our interactions with media like television and film. A, a lot of that in, in today's society, in, in today's Western society, may place intense emphasis on the experience in the material world at the expense of uh, a deeper introspective exploration of the psychic world, the emotional world, and the inner dimension. We, 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 we're sort of at the zenith of materialism today, where we have advanced technologies, but our advanced technologies are not uh, on mass or in great, you know, in, in the greatest volume, giving portrayal to these richer inner dimensional experiences. Rather, there's greater emphasis on our consumerism that we need mm -hmm. to we need to purchase something uh, in order to acquire happiness. But but the the mystic says that the, the key to happiness is within our, ourselves, and all we have to do is reflect, you know, upon that potential with, with sincere intensity to realize it. So the, what, 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 where this leads to, or leads back to, is that Sasha has invoked the mirror in his discussion of the Platonic cave. And the, the mirror as archetype and as instrumentation accompanies many mystical traditions worldwide. We could find other citations. We could look to the Feng Shui mirror of the Taoists, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. example. And, and, and accompanying that, we could see the links to the to the prehistoric medicine people of the Asian steppe and the role of the reflective surface in the inducement of a trance. That the, that the study mm -hmm. of a reflection offered the premise that uh, that deep introspection could follow. It's so instructive, you see, in, in this, such a simple way. When we when we when we understand that the t in, in common English usage, the term reflection uh, has imp implies meditation. You know, in common uses, what mm -hmm. I'm re I am reflecting upon this this issue or this ideation. I am meditating like that. Then we see that the mirror surface has always has always born or invoked that kind of quality. I, I imagine in my you know in my mind I imagine that primitive people, sometime in the distant past, uh, it, you know, were, were were making their way through the forest. You know, perhaps searching for food or shelter or so, some something of significance, or maybe on a, a spirit quest. You know, a, a, a junior medicine person on an initiatory quest who's left, left the, the village to go out and, and to find you know, their spirit guide or their, you know, the inner spirit of, of, of healing from within themselves. And upon mm -hmm. that journey, they come across a, a lake or a pond, a, a watery surface that's still. And in, on that still surface, they can clearly see a reflection. And if they see in that reflection th that they can observe what is, what, what is behind them, then the implication is that they, that they if we if we ex extend that vision to infinity, you know, arithmetically, then the suggestion is that within the reflection is is the potential to see the point of origin, the place from which we oh. emerged, and so the mirror uh, possesses very powerful archetypal invocative characteristics, and 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 I'm I need to express that I, I'm mirror filtering all the, this audio to, to do my study. I'm studying the reflection in the mirror of the of the audio signal. So it's 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 not difficult to find it in the Western folklore of the last 500 years. References to the magic mirror are popular. Uh, the Sleeping Beauty, 
uh, uh, mm-hmm. many of these Disney type stories. Uh, the, the, the mirror is, you know, it, it's a talking mirror. It's, the mirror has a message for us. It speaks to us, you see, in, in that construct. Uh, it has yeah. magical qualities. We can see the past, present, and the future. And the parallels with that Western folkloric understanding also reside within the tantric tradition of Bengal and other parts of India, where the mystics uh, could demonstrate with using a use of a mirror surface that they could produce visions in the mind of an audience where they would see in the mirror, they would see the events of their past lives. They would see as if they were watching a movie they would see manifestations in the reflection of their past lives. In, in the Greek tradition, and I, I've forgotten the name of this uh, particular practice, but uh, I've, I have read that at the, uh, in the you know, 500 BC f- uh, to you know, 1 AD period, there was a practice whereby the, the relatives of the deceased would enter a, a, a cave-like space with water in it, and they would hope to see in the water's reflection the, the image of the deceased. And that this was actually, it, it, it was part of the cultural practice of those times that the, the ancient Greeks uh, believed that they could do uh, grief and recovery work using a mirror surface. Uh, and that's- uh, You know, Raymond Moody, uh, our, co- our colleague, has done this very same thing using uh, uh, tubs of olive oil, and he started doing it with people in uh, Greece. Uh, somehow, the, sometimes the person they were in, evoking didn't come, it was somebody else. But then he started doing it in America, too. And I want to say, you know, it, it does come from the Hindu tradition, ultimately, but in our own Western uh, existential tradition, Heidegger talks about epoche, where you uh, think about the part of yourself that's thinking about yourself and think about the part of yourself that's thinking about the part of you. And you do basically keep reflecting, reflecting uh, from uh, uh, on the reflector until you ultimately come to the source point. It's just an intellectual way of, of um, I think, the exact same process. I, I, I believe you are correct that I had read Ray, Raymond Moody, Life After Life, and he had cited this practice. Uh, so you, you, you know better than I about, uh, about his research on this. Uh, but, but what I mean to emphasize simply, though, is that encounters with reflective surfaces were possible mm-hmm. throughout the world in ancient times. And in fact, uh, apparently four, four billion odd years ago, in the early days of planet Earth, there were lakes of methane on the planet. And if anyone had been around in those times, and I remain open to the possibility that, that, that perhaps people from distant planets were here. I mean, I, was, I, I don't remember yeah. myself, but it's, it's quite possible that if any intelligent person was there at the time, they would have seen a reflection in those surfaces. So the universe, in other words, is constructed in such a way, it seems, that uh, these, these signposts are evident in, in normal experience, particularly in the natural environment. The signposts to inner reflection are upon us in every way because it's inherent within the, the design of the universe itself. The universe wants us to realize our, uh, our origins as expressions of, you know, of the loving, divine, cosmic consciousness from the tantric perspective. And so the universe is constructed in such a way with all these different signposts. The, reflect, the concept of reflection is upon us every time we encounter any, any sort of surface that offers that opportunity. And, and the most sensitive people, it would seem to me, throughout history would be capable of spontaneous trance uh, mm-hmm. Once they made contact with those reflections, it would it would occur to them, and that that and that the mirror would become a, an instrument or tool for that person to revisit that trance state. Uh, who is it that uh, is Nar- Narcissus? Is the Greek yeah, yeah. myth of the of the youth who is apparently enchanted with their own reflection? Uh, but I, I tell I tell the stories I tell the story slightly differently. Because in, in, the, in the tellings that I've read, which are just the, you know, the English language translations, you know, the narcissist is, is, is condemned. You know, that quality is not encouraged. But my, my reading of, of, the, of the, the primal character of the, of the narcissist myth is that 
uh, is that, that that person is engaged in a deep trance. And they, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, Narcissus falls into the water and drowns. And that's the moral of the story is don't, don't get too engaged with self-reflection or you'll die. But the, in the tantric sense, what it, all it signifies is that uh, they merged with the waters of consciousness. <laughs> That's all it really means. They fell into the ocean of consciousness, which is actually a great thing. So we have I, I, these literary references are complex uh, for several reasons, one of which being is that today's humans uh, in the West uh, experience these universal and indigenous sources from the, a colonialist perspective yeah. rather than you know, uh, that of the person born from within that society. And, and that, that lensing of, uh, in some ways may provide unfortunate distortions of what simple truths we may otherwise be able to realize. And, I, and I'm citing this, I'm saying that my readings of the 19th century translations of the Nar Narcissus myth are, are, are moralizing about self-reflection when in fact that may be a very powerful tool and, 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 and that, uh, you know, a mer merger with the waters of consciousness, the ocean of consciousness, you know, the, the same one that Vishnu is floating on, that may be an awesome experience. Uh, we, maybe we shouldn't be so, you know, so, so hands off about that. Uh, one of the things to do when you're uh, reading uh, material like that is to remote view from the uh, consciousness of, of the protagonists and antagonists in the story so that you can feel as much as possible what it's like to be in those times and places with those um, cues that you would uh, be responding to. You know, it's an interesting way to expand a bit. Well, I, I do think that ultimately because the truths the, of the be, that the best traditions can offer us are our uh, expositions of what's already inside of us are their their descriptions of our potential that yeah we, what we the most sensitive people simply need is, is a touch point they just need to touch mm -hmm. base with that in the external form and just like that sensitive person who sees the reflection and becomes entranced uh, the the journey the journey starts the journey takes them on, on its own way all they need is initiate all they need is that initiatory contact and so when i offer my work as an alternative therapist and i present my findings derived from these studies these mirror reflections in human speech those become the touch points for the for the participant they when they hear those sounds some of those sounds become very invocative and as a consequence there is a lot of testimony about my work that catharsis occurs in the first session catharsis being a uh, significant release of emotional material in other words the entrancement of the unconscious mind through engagement with the reflection is something that is practical and manifests in my sessions and there's a lot of testimony regarding it. that's why this that's why the, the phd psychologists say that it's extremely psychoactive is is the frequency uh, of the uh, sounds uh, theta is slower different than the uh, than the manifest well, we're talking here about wavelength, frequency, and amplitude questions. And so to clarify, in my study of yoga, what we're pursuing is the high amplitude, low frequency wave and mm -hmm. with the object of merging with a wave of infinite, infinite wavelength. That normal waking consciousness is of higher frequency, but that breakthrough consciousness or the entranced consciousness is is occurring on slower uh, slower frequencies, but the waves are of greater amplitude. This relates to the ocean and the you know the notion of, of merger into the ocean of consciousness that the wave is so great that we are absorbed you know like a drop uh, a droplet of water that merges with you know a, a greater body the an ocean uh, that's the that's wow. the samadhi of yoga that's a, a metaphor for that experience. So uh, my studies do, do not rely, in other words, on uh, to clarify, do not rely on measurements of uh, frequency in, in that arithmetic way, because I'm reporting, I'm reporting a narrative, and that narrative is conveyed mm -hmm. in, in, in simple English language. Uh, my, my clients can't, if I said to my client, you know, uh, that message at 432 hertz really got, got me excited, that may, may or may not be meaningful to them. But, but if, I, <laughs> if, if I shared with them that 
uh, you know, these findings, these, just, these discussions about your relationship with your father inform me about some of the difficulty you may have felt growing up that, that may be very powerful for them and they may be able to, you know, act, th their emotions may be able to express under those conditions. Okay, oh, just, question. Oh, okay, just so we, we used to do an e-meter or electro, uh, uh, a, 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 the uh, blockage of the electrical response across a contact, uh, even if a person on the surface is, we're, you're saying dog, cat, house, mother, with the same tone. And when you say mother, it goes wah, 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 up and down the needle. And so, in other words, suddenly you've created an, an electromagnetic skin response uh, that's blocking the uh, the charge. And so I imagine something like that is 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 going on too with, with what you're doing. Well, all, all right. So, 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 so I have a couple. Oh, go ahead, John. You respond, so, and then I have a question. Go ahead. Thank you. So to speak <laughs> to that, the um, the measurements are the 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 participant gauges their own response, and the 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 measurable effect is is uh, noted through the feelings that arise. The, the client's feelings come to the surface, and the, and the feelings can be very mysterious because people may harbor latent sadness or latent anger or latent fear from due to unresolved trauma yeah. and they, due to dissociation, which is a powerful self-defense mechanism, particularly for children who are surviving trauma. Um, mm -hmm. Dissociation may shelter the ego from perceptions of those feelings. And so when they come back to earth, so to speak, when they, when they are brought into a scenario, a safe setting where they can you know, ha participate in that encounter, it may be incredibly alien and foreign to them. You know, the feelings they'll report, they say, I'm feeling these feelings. I don't know why I'm feeling these feelings, but I'm feeling these feelings. And so I'm working on that, that feeling level, and, and, and I'm, I'm, measuring, I'm measuring progress in the session through the participants reporting. How do they feel? And inevitably, through this bombardment of these sound waves that you know, we're listening to together, it, 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 it can provoke this kind of very powerful emotional response. And with, with that caveat in place that the emotions that emerge may be incredibly mysterious to the person who has harbored them. And I say it's, it's simply related to, to, dissoci to dissociation. That, in other words, that the, that the emotions origins uh, from, let's say, a childhood trauma that was unmanageable at that time, the child did not have the resources to manage what, what was occurring, that was the source mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. difficulty at the time, the source of confusion. Uh, the, the survival mechanism uh, is typically dis dissociation, psychic dissociation, uh, which leads to all kinds of other problems. You know, when, when people are disembodied and still trying to li live in the world, they may have a lot of functional issues. They may even have physical health issues related to that. And so, you know, getting the mind back into the body and not just, you know, into the yeah. gene chakra, but like we're doing the tantric journey, you know, from crude to subtle. That means we may have to journey all the way through the crudest, you know, the crudest senses to, to, to uh, identify the inhibitors. And when the inhibitors are lifted, then the spontaneous response is joy and the, and the, pers the, the person lifts themselves up. But the, uh, again, so what I'm getting to is that through subjection to the sound waves that are found in my work, the, the deep feelings, the deepest feelings are provoked. And this, this cues the idea that we live in an acoustic universe. And from a yogic perspective, all the, the, the chakra and other kinds of instrumentation that's in the body, are, are acoustic constructs. And this is why the yogis calibrate the chakras through the recitation of mantra, which is sound waves. So this, this same, the same effect occurs in the sessions. And so Janet, you, you go ahead and speak, please. Yeah, I don't know if you know that, that we are um, yoga masters. <laughs> Dr. Sasha and I are tantra masters and we're about to engage in a uh, another round of uh, teaching a, a bunch of students uh, up to the certification level. But this, um, 
This is fascinating. I think this could fast track us into clearing just chakra energies and Kundalini awakenings and uh, engaging humanity in a, a greater capacity of, uh, towards this evolution of consciousness and awakening that is so critical this time uh, for the very survival of uh, our species in this planet. So I'm extremely excited about your work and I, I somehow want to study with you and find out how to integrate this into this practice that we're about to uh, take to a, the next generation. We're, we're seniors <clears throat> and there's uh, two uh, 30-somethings that want to come learn from us, but I think we need to learn <laughs> from you to integrate this into our, our chakra balancing and clearing and, and the reintegration of the divine feminine and masculine. My question, I just want to say a few things. I know we're all excited here because this is just revolutionary. Um, is Can you take this analysis from anybody's speech? Like... Uh, you know, Trumps or, or go uh, back and do Obamas or anybody and, and find these hidden words within it. It's kind of like, reminds me of the Beatles back in, I'm a child of the Paul 60s. Paul is dead. Paul is dead, right? <laughs> we, we played the, ra the record background. Can this be done with just about everything and anything to find out uh, kind of like if they're lying or what's the underlying truth of any information that's being conveyed to us? This kind of inquiry is, is possible in any situation where you have speakers and listeners and all, all it really requires in terms of instrumentation is a little bit of recording equipment and a little bit of editing, a, a few editing tools. So it's instrumentation and you know, practical stuff is not that difficult. And it's not, as you said, it's not that hard to find sources of material. I, I've been studying speakers around the world and reporting them, you know, publishing findings as a journalist for years. Uh, and some of the stories that were significant in my work uh, w were studies where I revealed the names of Russian spies nine months before they were published in the Wall Street Journal. I, I, re I revealed a revived CIA Phoenix program three years before it was published in The Intercept. Uh, so these are practical, wow. practical intelligence and counterintelligence studies. And as, as Janet had cited in my biography, I most famously was reporting details of the shock and awe strikes in, in, against Baghdad that marked the inception of the Iraq war. I, I was reporting that the Monday after the president gave his inaugural address. Wow. So, so, so were they going after the uh, uh, stuff in the, uh, in the museum? Was that true, or what do you think? I think that the point you're raising about the cultural looting and destruction is a very important point for several different reasons. The, the burning of the libraries upon the, upon the, uh, you know, the, in the early days of the invasion was an incredible crime against education and intellectual culture, to say the least. Oh. You know, when, when you rob people of their, of their history, when people become, uh, uh, you know, a people with no past, the, the 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 kind of psychological and cultural damage is uh, is severe. It's a very very terrible thing uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I I don't personally have any special insight, although I had read the headlines of the day, and probably I was reading Stuart Swerdlow's articles at that time. It's quite possible uh, where these discussions of the esoteric. Uh, you know, uh, artifacts that may or may not have resided in, in Iraq in that time. Uh, I don't have any personal insight or, or facts into that, which leads to an expansion on, on Janet's question, which is, you know, can we find everything in everything? I think, you know, in, in the general sense, is it possible, right? Can I, can I Indiana Jones every mystery? And there, in, in real practical sense, the answer is no. My personal destiny doesn't, doesn't set me up to answer every question that's out there. Uh, there are, you know, there are stories that, are, that will be my stories, and my job is really to figure out which ones those are and get to work on them, and, to, and at the same time to right. recognize the areas where I'm not going to be able to make progress and some better person may be able to do it, but I shouldn't be, you know, it's just not for me. It's not going to happen. Uh, and, and I think that what's significant in, in, when, I, when I describe that is that my track record is very good. In any field of specialized research, you know, where people have, are dealing with graduate studies and fine sciences and stuff, the rate of discovery uh, there's, there's, you know, rule of thumb is sort of like one major discovery every 25 years. That's that. There's, a, Shasta, would you agree that that's sort of there's a common discussion about these ideas that one major breakthrough every that's 25 years? That's what they often say, but and I don't believe it at all because I think it's accelerating. All right, all right, all right. Well, you and I are on the same page because I, I'm, I'm showing uh, significant breakthroughs 
over a 20 year period, like lots of them, not just one. Yeah. So, so I, I'm on board with this idea that all of us, all of us have this potential, have breakthrough potential. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm working as a therapist because I'm, I'm trying to mobilize people around their own potential to get on with manifesting their cosmic uh, you know, powerful overcoming abilities, you know, solution creating ability. I, I'm, I'm all about that. Uh, so uh, I, I wanted to stress and what's, what Sasha has distressed for, together with me is, is this idea that the, 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 real, the real human experience is about breakthrough after breakthrough. And what we want, what, what we want to do in my work is, is to encourage people to, to, to learn that about themselves through experience. When, when people break through into the mysterious emotions that may have been like weighing them down, weighing down their progress in different parts of their lives and their relationships, careers, or, you know, decision making, then uh, they, when they witness themselves in the role of the solution creator, that, that's such a powerful teaching that mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I, I can't, you know, John Kelly can't make that happen. I can, I can create circumstances where they can take that journey, but uh, it's ultimately, it's their ability that's, that's the solution provider. I, I was the facilitator. You know, there was a story in the news this week about a, a very courageous American Special Forces soldier who retired from the military service and, and became an international aid worker. And it was on all of the major news, CBS, everybody was talking about this fellow, that he had, in one instance, he had run across uh, a road in Syria to rescue a three-year-old girl uh, under sniper fire. All these people had been dropped by sniper fire. He was there. He saw the girl on the other side. He ran through the fire to rescue the child. And this, this wow. is a, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this is a real hero because with all of his capabilities, yeah. he invested his powers in, in service to others, at, you know, at tremendous risk. And that, you know, this, that's, to me, that's the, that's the real hero. Uh, but, but the metaphor is that, is that in, in psychological counseling, that the inner child is waiting to be discovered within us. And if we are burdened by perceptions of trauma, fears, difficult emotions, confusion, it's like a fire, a fire field that we'd have to, we would have to journey through to get to that other side. So the counselor is the facilitator who makes that walk through the fire possible, who creates circumstances where it's possible to undertake what otherwise is perceived as the impossible journey. And that the integration with that part of the self that had been d d uh, separated psychologically through dissociation and who may be a very creative part of the self, you know, who may be uh, in the Vaishnava tradition, maybe like baby Krishna, you know, with all those, you know, magical abilities. Uh, we, if, to, to engage with that part of the self may, se may seem like an impossible journey, but in, in this kind of facilitation, again and again and again, we create the circumstances where people can, can walk through the field of fire and can engage with the inner child and have a successful rescue and a successful integration. And this is a very powerful statement in, for these times that this opportunity is upon us. And I, I, I feel confident and I feel you know, grateful that both with both of you, with your deep backgrounds and experiential understandings of the questions we're discussing, that you, your experiences reflect this idea about you know that the solutions are waiting to be discovered and 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 this time of any time is the time for all of us to get engaged with those solutions and to work closely with our own inner potential to to manifest to cultivate our our, our ultimate abilities you know let's not wait till our next life cycle. let's do it now right Right. Exactly, and so you know, but it seems to me you know, that sh whether it's sonar or, or, or somatic, whatever the bridge uh, to the deeper experience is, what's really important is that you somehow uh, transfer your charisma, that what allows you to be so successful, uh, to other people who in turn train other people. Do you? Uh, it, it seems to me that that's what makes it work. Do you have some kind of program like that going, John? Well, I think what I'm hearing you ask is, do I do I offer formal training? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but which is an important question. But I'm going to speak to the subtler element of your question, which relates to to modeling behavior. 
Uh-huh. I work in my counseling, I work specifically by telephone or Skype. I don't work face to face at all because to do my work, I only require the speech signal and to produce these results, I only require, you know, s- spoken communications. Uh, the, the advantage of this for the participant is that they uh, all of the all of the inhibitors that accompany face to face encounters are removed from the session that, you know, territorialism and other, you know, visual cues. They like the way I look. They don't like the way I look, whatever. All of that is out of the mm-hmm. picture. So we just deal with the issues. It's much more, it simplifies that. Uh, and, and so, but, but that modeling, you see, absent all those other visual cues, uh, the, the, the intuition of the participant has to grasp onto something. You know, my, my voice becomes the guiding, uh, you know, the, be- the beacon, so to speak, in those c- conditions. <laughs> and the voice is produced from the resonant cavity of my body. So my emotional condition, my psychological outlook, my health condition, all of those things are, in, are actually, uh, can be detected through the sound of my voice. How I sound, you know, sometimes we, we mm-hmm. don't sound, you know, if you're, you're in radio, of course, so you, sometimes people don't sound so good. You know, they got a cold, right? And they, don't, they sound kind of sick, right? And other, right. other people manifest incredible, um, incredible uh, vitality. You know that their mm-hmm. their voice is energized, and is, and when you listen to it, it's energizing. In the tantric tradition within which I studied, there is a, a type of entity called a siddha deva, which mm-hmm. is the mind of a spiritual practitioner that is still here in this universe, but maybe disembodied, and that that siddha deva tra- travels through sound waves, and that the voice of the practitioner who cultivates the Siddha Deva through yogic practice becomes a transmitter of the Siddha Deva into the auditory world of the listener. And so uh, that the role of the Siddha Deva, for, you know, from a tantric medicine perspective, cannot be overlooked in my work because, uh, like yourselves, I, uh, I, I, I have a history of deeply immersive practice in, in classical yoga. Yeah. Wow. That's so that explains so much. What's really interesting uh, to me is for many, many years, I, I, I'm certified in Vinny Yoga. Um, after we uh, two hour workouts every morning, uh, ending a lot, a lot of it uh, with the airplane and stuff like that, right on the on the pelvic bone, we would go into deep trance and everybody was having Kundalini releases. We didn't know what it was in the, uh, Gary Kraft, so the teacher was didn't tell anybody what we were doing, but we were all, it took me a, a studying Tantra to realize oh my gosh everybody in that room is having a group orgasm and uh, having a spiritual experience just built right into the physical practice of this very minute yoga which makes you totally unable to think <laughs> yes and so this this potentially when when we taste the, the good food we, we lose our desire for the other you know for the junk food and we and we want we want the finer the finer thing. Once we become aware of its existence, our urge is to is to pursue that. Uh, in in the mm-hmm. Vaishnava conception, all of the desires are merged into one desire. This is what Krishna says to Arjuna on the battlefield. When all the desires merge into the one desire, then that one desire is fulfilled, and that 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 one desire being the sum of all desires, which means that all of our desires are filled at once. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if you could maybe break down a little bit. Uh, we're going to be coming up on our break in just a couple minutes here, so we'll probably reserve this for the, the second half. <laughs> this is the first hour is going very fast, but a little bit more on what you go into when you do your sessions. Uh, what are some of the things, um, I wish we had you, the audio, maybe you could, uh, I was listening to the thing you did with the uh, Laurie and Fenton and somewhere I, I heard something about the voice that came out. Oh, I think it's on your website. Yeah. Uh, go to your, play your sample, voice. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we could, uh, I don't know how we can do it. I guess play a sample of that. Uh, what kind of things emerge? So basically people are talking to you and they get little things that come out, kind of like uh, the Paul was dead type thing. Is that what you're saying? I, I conduct an interview, which is 10 to 15 minutes in length. It's a very short discovery process. 
and I study that sample for about an hour or so, and I produce findings which are burst mode messages, unconscious statements. When I studied the president's uh, inaugural address, I heard the words mission of Baghdad. And when the pastor spoke after the president, I heard the words missile attack. It's very simple remarks. But, but when you add it up, the, the shock and awe strike on Baghdad in 2003 was a missile attack. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. We're on our break. We will be back in about five minutes. Thank you very much for listening to the Cosmos Connection on Radio at no, Well, what I, we were talking about just before um, the break was this this wonderful method, is, which I just, I, I, I get it. You don't um, confound uh, uh, your session with the uh, reactions to your person or your environment. Uh, and it's, it's just, it's so clean. I really, really like it. And, uh, and so what we wanted to hear and I think we got it together in the break is a sample of this, the, the type of uh, on the surface and below message with the data and, uh, that John is dealing with. Yo. So, uh, Tom, is that queued up and ready to go? Or, or do you want to say something before we go into it? Yes, yeah, John. Something first. Okay, excellent. So uh, th this clip, uh, one of my clients is, is talking about an uh, experience from the, when they were very young. They had a younger brother, and you know how it is with siblings that the, the elder may have to hold the younger's hands when they cross the street and such. And so oh, yeah. th this, this woman uh, was out, out in public with her young brother, and they're crossing the street together, and uh, somehow he, the young brother breaks free. And these are, very, you know, very, these are very young children, and he's struck by a car, and he passes due to that accident. So, my, oh my goodness. so we'll hear we'll hear in the first part of the audio we'll hear the spoken testimony this is just like a ufo contactee who's has questions about their experience this is somebody who has experiences in their family of origin that they're exploring and the emotions that accompany it so let's roll that clip how did that impact on your image of yourself as someone who was responsible who could take care of other people um, you can be trusted with responsibility. What happened? Well, I don't. I don't know how to verbalize it. Um, okay, if we pause here. Okay, so the client says that they they can't articulate their feelings, which is very ins an insightful moment. You see, this is, this is mm -hmm. a perception of an obstacle to communications that's arising. They say, I don't know how to verbalize it. But when I listened to them in the session, I heard them say, better hang on to him. So let's roll. Better hang on to him. Wow. There it is. Wow. And so this notion of attachment arises in that statement, which informs us in many ways. On one level, the physical contact with her young brother meant they were holding hands. And she, as a responsible elder, she was to maintain that grip. But from a psychological perspective, she, she describes attachment to emotions and a memory of that trauma. I, I better hang on to the memory of what happened to my younger brother. And so if, if, that, if, that, if the feelings of guilt and sadness that may accompany that are inhibitors to growth and development, the goal of the work would be to uh, relieve the inhibitor. And, and, and the, simple, you know, the simple answer, you know, lo love being the answer to everything ultimately, but to get there, you know, to get to self-forgiveness, here we, we, we take a journey. The, the answer becomes, to, I forgive myself, my role in, in, in what happened, you know, for my part. I don't want to punish myself because I was party to a situation where I had no control. She had no control over the fact that he broke free. It was circumstantial. Yeah. So t that person needs to be liberated emotionally from that construct and through self-forgiveness uh, and so on. That did, this, part of, did part of, did, did, did that young boy uh, want to die on some level? And on some level, did they have sibling rivalry and she didn't hold on tight enough? Because, you know, the, the end result was what happened, right? You're, That's you're, what Freud would say. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, I think. But at some level, they participated in the outcome of what happened. Uh, that all the parties were bound together by destiny. Yeah. The, the fact that they were born in the same family 
relates to notions of karma, for example, and that mm -hmm. the fulfillment of karma uh, is, is a major driver of human experience in the yogic perspective, that we are here resolving our desires. So the desire for that experience, you know, it was like the, uh, it was like the, the counter wave to an earlier event, you know, from a karmic perspective. Now, my study didn't focus particularly on the, the good questions that you've asked, Janet, but I, but I understand that those are good questions. Uh, I, my simple understanding at, at the, as we speak today is that the parties were bound by circumstances beyond their control. The events transpired, and, and my goal in that session, within that one meeting, with the limited time that I had, was to get the client from uh, trauma to recovery. Uh, and yeah, yeah, you know, I, yeah, I understand totally. I, in, in existentialism, we, we start just with the assumption, if I created this uh, experience for my own growth and evolution, uh, uh, what is the message I could take from this encounter? And rather than say, uh, let go of the part of you that, uh, say, um, space is out. Uh, we say space out, um, you know, uh, you've contributed, you tell us how you've contributed to her life then and continue to contribute to her life and uh, what, your, what are your underlying needs and interests. Uh, we don't want to kill you because sometimes she may choose from her center to identify with you space out, but what signal would you like to give her so she can consider whether or not in this situation that she's confronted with, uh, what, what, she, uh, what are your concerns? and then she will look at it from her witness. It's, you know, it would take a bit of time. I understand you had limited time, but uh, that's kind of where I would go with that kind of a situation. You know, so, so in my work, the, the emotion becomes present in that moment. The encounter with uh -huh. the message facilitates the expression of the emotion and that the client mm -hmm. is encouraged to make contact with that emotion through an inner directed inquiry, which may be for them visual, auditory, or kinesthetic just like your NLP. Um, when they have a uh -huh. grip on that uh, state, they may perceive that the expression is occurring at some location in their body. And surprisingly, mm -hmm. or perhaps not surprisingly, the typical report is that the, the feeling corresponds with, uh, with a chakra location in the body. And so mm -hmm. the client is encouraged to visit that location in an inner directed journey and to report their findings upon contact with that place. And through very simple breath work, the client uh, transforms the conditions at that location to their satisfaction and, and they manifest the, the new vision at that location of that place of feeling within themselves, you know, in a self-led way that I only facilitate. In other words, I don't dictate the outcome. Mm -hmm. Rather, I facilitate their discovery of what is right for them, uh, trusting that wow. trust, trusting that their inner guidance is is intelligent enough to make to help them to make their own decisions. I love your methodology. That is so beautiful. I hope you train a lot of people. Now, do they go into? Have, have you had clients that go into like strong emotional release and catharsis? Yes, this is commonly reported that catharsis in one session occurs in my work. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, so have you done follow-up on the, these procedures to see how effective the reprogramming is? Well, I don't speak in terms of programming and reprogramming, but I do have scenarios where I have clients who've worked with me over long periods of time, like a year and a half. Uh, but I will say that due to the intensity of the work that, I'm, that we're performing together, that uh, for many people, this may be a once in a lifetime experience, that the heavy lifting that occurs is so transformational that they, they need time to assimilate and to uh, recalibrate and to, nor and to bring their new insights and, and expressions into their everyday life, which, you know, in other words, uh, I'm not, I, I, I can see people every two weeks, but, but it seems to me that once, you know, once you give, if you have, if you have children, once your kid gets that new skateboard, you know, the idea is kind of get them, get them out there riding the skateboard, you know, it's like, 
let's find out what life is like on two wheel or four wheels, right? So, so uh, right. that's an important part of it. But yeah, I've worked with, uh, in some cases, I've had clients who, who, who've completed 18 sessions, 25 sessions. And to me, those people are heroes because the heavy lifting that they endured, if, I, if I'm reporting and if you accept my claim and the testimony of the PhD psychologist who, who worked with me, if you accept the claim of, of catharsis in one session, and I'm talking about the first session, the first appointment, then that, that's extremely intense work. And most people, even those who are very familiar with psychiatric counseling, those people will find that to be a, a, a incredible amount of heavy lifting and for many, for many, that will be a lifetime journey in one session that they may never, you know, their, their urge to come back into that. It may affect them, their, their primal response to it may, may mean that they, what they really need is to take a break from working with me and, and just go out in the world and experience, you know, experience life with those new attributes manifest. One of the, some of the reporting that comes back is people say things like their personalities changed. They say their responses to everyday situations that were difficult for them prior, they, they, they manifested new responses, like the difficult person at the workplace, you know, that they, everyone's in their nine to five working together and not everyone's getting along to the best of their ability. And they have, you know, difficult personalities and, 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 and suddenly that difficult person was no longer a problem. They managed, they managed dealing with that person in a way that was graceful and effortless, and they felt that that would have been impossible before. So these are, these are, this are your discussions about feelings and psychological outlooks, but more, more you know, uh, dramatic examples arise when I've worked with people who had uh, neurological injury, like people who had survived car accidents and, and had closed mm -hmm. head injuries. I had a client in, years ago who had completed their PhD, had suffered a closed head injury, and then had gone back to school in their recovery to, for a second degree. And they, they wrote this effusive testimony. I, I, have, I probably have it right here at my desk about working with me. Oh my God, you know, it's just so powerful. I have it right in front of me. Uh, our session was the turning point for me. I wasn't myself. Uh, taking prescriptions, high blood pressure. Uh, they completed the work. They, they left their, their relationship. They took back their power is what they're saying. The work saved their life. This is really heavy lifting. So this, yeah. this, they, 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 you know, that person who went back to school said that their performance had changed. They were no longer the quick wit that they had once been. You know, by circumstances, things had changed. But yet the, the return to functionality they felt that the work uh, was so personal for them. It, you know, it was so, uh, how do you say, it? so unique to, their, to, to addressing their personal requirements because it was, all of the findings were derived from this scan of their personal voice, not, not, a, not, not something where I you know, consulted a reference book like a dream dictionary and, and gave them a cookie cutter you know, solution. Uh, it was a so you, very personal. You pay, you pay you pay back their voice to them. They hear their own voice saying these things. Just like my client, we today heard my heard my client talking about hanging on. Right. And in the session, my, in my reporting, once I've discovered my findings, I come back. Just like I've been in an X-ray lab, and now I come back uh -huh. and, and with my findings, and we look at the the, the X-ray together. We listen to the discovery together, and we and we encounter that. And now, as a special caveat, it's important to understand that I don't warranty that anybody can hear what I claim to hear. I don't uh -huh. warranty that I can make anybody hear anything that I claim to hear. And I don't warranty that I can necessarily hear what other people hear. So uh, there is, you know, there's certain uh, th things that occur under those conditions. You know, I'm reporting something to somebody. Let's say I'm saying to somebody, right. it says you're angry at your dad. And they're looking at me like, you know, on the other end of the phone, <laughs> what's this guy talking about? And, and I have to, ru I well, have, I have to me, represent let that. Let me thing. ask you about that. So you're playing it back in their voice. Now, do you tell them what it says or you let them hear it first and then they say, oh, it says I'm mad at my dad. Or do you, like that, she said, uh, hold on to him. Are you, are you better hold on to him, right? So 
did she come up with that? What she was saying, or did you say that that's what she was saying? Well, this is a very interesting when question you, because when CBS Television uh, flew me into Cleveland f for the Nielsen Sweeps Weeks in 2006, they brought me into the studio and under closed door on camera conditions, their reporter sat with me, and we 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 took her audio and we studied it on the editor together, and she began to report the findings. She began to testify to the veracity of what was she, we, we were discovering. But for expediency purposes, well, people hire me as an expert. Uh, if I was a mountain guide taking you guys up Everest, uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily just cut you loose and say, go find your own way. You kind of, if you hired me, you kind of be counting on me to, you know, give you the expertise, insights, and, and the shortcuts to help you. And so, for expediency purposes, I simply pronounce my findings. Uh, you know, it's the client can take it or leave it, but but I say uh, in in my history, no one who has ever hired me who was so ambivalent. By the time someone comes into work with me, there's a there's a reason why they're there. And I have a duty to find out what that reason is and to, to try to facilitate its uh, expression. And, and part, of the ex part of doing that is, is being expedient and direct. Uh, now, why would, anyone, so, why would anyone trust my you know, opinions on these questions? I think this is an you know, important part of what you're relating. Why would anyone you know, want to hear from John? Well, I think the, the, the most important thing that we could all look at together is that it's, there are indisputable facts that show that I reported important information in uh, military intelligence, in counterintelligence operations against Russian interference in domestic affairs, as well as in uh, surveillance of the deep state. Uh, and all of this that I published was third party uh, documented as, as being published before the mainstream papers reported it. I've, I've said I've shared some more audio, so let's go back to the sort of fact base. This is where the public really meets me, as if you know I'm in the public sphere on a radio show talking about the news. This is where they first learn about my work, and why you know why I would be uh, able to say that I I possessed any kind of expertise. You know, not just having opinions about things, but actually uh, that my claims withstood the test of time. Let's load the Anna Chapman clip, if we could, please. Cool. So this, this clip is, a, is a, a known Russian spy who was extradited from the United States who had been living in New York uh, and had gone to a trade show uh, to, to talk about employment in, in some field. I can't remember what field it was in. But they're interviewing with a, with a human resources person at a trade show. And so that, that uh -huh. interview was later published. And I, and I studied this because I wanted to understand if I could penetrate into the mind of the Russian spy. This was a known spy. Let's play that forward portion of Anna Chapman. You know, be scared, do it anyway. Um, and not only that, you have a lot of people that go a lot in a long way to success. And you have many people that are thinking about doing this, you know, going this way, this direction. So it's very important to bring these two parts together when someone can see that this can happen and inspire, you know, inspire them to, to go forward with their ideas. Okay, pause. And so here, I'm, for expedience again, I'm just going to you know, iterate. This is, this is a story, I mean, this has already yeah. happened. So what I heard was the words, let's pull a Vegas drop with Tim. So let's play that audio. Okay, so wow. Anna Chapman the known spy, and by the time I, I come to the story, it's already known that she's a Russian spy, is talking about uh, other people in, you know, in, their, in, in terms of their first name. And so I report this, the, you know, the names of other parties are, are manifesting through her speech. What could it mean? Nine months later, the Wall Street Journal, citing anonymous U.S. officials, says that Tim Foley was the youth accomplice of the Anna Chapman spy ring. Tim wow. Foley was named in my publication nine months earlier. The links that Janet has shared on the Aquarian Radio website 
these articles are posted and you can follow the links and all you have to do is look at the date stamps on those servers. I don't own those servers, I don't operate those servers. Those servers are independent records of these events. That independent third party documentation can be subpoenaed in a court. And you know, a close forensic look will show that I reported the name Tim in relation to Anna Chapman nine months before the Wall Street Journal. So this qualification is quite intense. I'm naming yeah. foreign operatives in high profile cases before the major papers publish them, but the, the, pa the papers are citing unnamed US officials. I don't know anybody in Washington, DC. Right. Hey, have you been hassled because you've been uh, uh, disclosing stuff that uh, the government doesn't want you to disclose? Well, that's just the story of my entire career. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> I am under so I much, a, I'm under so ahead, much pressure. Talk. My work is under so much pressure. <laughs> it's, you know, it's almost indescribable the, 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 uh, how difficult my journey uh, has become, and this is the yin and the yang, you know, the, the balance, you know, to, 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 in other words, to manifest this kind of facility in this world in 2017, uh, I've had to make uh, serious personal sacrifices to things like my human rights in order to continue uh, along this uh, provenly, you know, authentic path. I, I made, I, I willfully chose when I understood what was going on, but absolutely, I've paid a, a, a serious personal price for pursuing this line of work. But because of my great belief in the potential of the, of the victims in recovery who I work with, because of my mm -hmm. great overarching belief in their potential and, and that their recovery meant a better society for, that we all live in, I uh, am fearless in pursuing this. I am absolutely fearless. Uh, and so I, I and the deep state have somehow learned to, to live together, although I would say it's an incredibly dysfunctional relationship. But uh, <laughs> the, the fact that I'm still here and I can talk to you about these things today is testimony to the fact that somehow we're all learning how to live together. Great. I, I wanted to just say a couple things, and, and then I want to bring it back to experiencers. First of all, uh, in 2011, I had a roommate, and she, she was uh, monitoring like, I don't know, 18 to 20 some levels of uh, communication uh, waves that are going through the air, and she was doing that type of thing. She was pulling out uh, intel, and apparently she worked for DARPA or something like that, and um, she would play back things to me all the time, and I could hear some, and I couldn't hear things, but she said that there were actually uh, space battles going up, and uh, I live in Maui, so up above us, and she was uh, interpreting this stuff as part of her job, and then in 2011, she killed herself. It was so intense, and she just got so wrapped up in it and she committed suicide. So I know this stuff is out here and it works and there's there's high level government officials that are, you know, they, they respect this and they monitor it and they, they get their intel and they, they solve problems and they know how to, you know, it's kind of like uh, the, um, uh, what was that called, the imitation game of the World War II. So now we're monitoring, uh, monitoring monitoring these um, sound waves and getting the, the what's going on in the communications that are just there in the air. So that's profound what you're doing. And so Tame is taking this application back to experiencers because I, I believe the microcosm reflects the macrocosm. And if we can heal the individuals one at a time, which will start healing uh, relationships and, and families and communities. And we can actually do this in our lifetime. I'd like to see this happen where we heal the planet. And this is critical work. Um, but one of the things I, I see with the experiencers is that they might have 20, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 critical incidences that need to be explored. So it may take more than one session. I'm, I'm just looking at how can we do this? Because, you know, the, these people are dealing with my labs. They're on board ships. They're being impregnated. Uh, they have fetuses taken away. Uh, their whole life is a lie. They can't tell their family. Uh, they lose their jobs. They lose relationships because they do say something. Or if, or if they don't say something, it affects them on a deep level. Uh, I just wanted to bring the, we have like a little bit less than a half an hour left, bring the conversation to experience level. Sash wants to say something. He's, he's oh, over here. I, I just, just, just a few things. <laughs> I, obviously, when uh, uh, government thinks you've got info that, that you're a candidate for my lab's ab 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 abduction, I've had so many people 
if you've got info they want, they do all kinds of weird things. I, I would suspect that happened to you. The, and another thing I find, I love your idea of giving uh, people the option of just one uh, session can uh, ch change everything. And I like to give people the inner therapist that's been modeling on you. You're a good one to model on. And so they have an inner John that can direct him. Uh, them in the open-ended direction that they need to go to reflect more when they end the session with you. Yeah, yeah we're not addicting people to therapy, but um, go ahead, John. Your so, thoughts. so again, you know, people are welcome to come back, but in practical experience, you know, if you if you have a deep, deep encounter with with a cultural phenomenon or you know a life experience, part of part of the natural expression of that is the ref, the, the time of reflection and and the hmm. integration and assimilation of that event, not simply going back and doing it again. Uh, so I, I, mm -hmm. I, 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 it was stressed to me you know, in my early days of my practice by a licensed clinical social worker in California named Dieter Dauber, who was very well known and respected by the people who worked with him. He took a great interest in my practice and he, and he stressed to me that the population seeks opportunities like this on their own terms. And so being available on, on call or on demand is more important than introducing formal structures. Uh, they, they, that, that rigidity may, you know, may not facilitate the best outcome. People will come when they're ready, to, you know, when it's natural <laughs> for them. And so I support that. And in the course of doing that, some people have, as I said, uh, done dozens of sessions, but for the majority of people alive today who encounter this work, it may be that a, a one-time journey like this is enough, uh, you know, in terms of what's manageable and what's natural for them. Uh, I, I'm open to meeting more, more of these super athletes, super performers who can handle the heavy living, because I, you know, I want those people empowered. Uh, but again, mm -hmm. it's, it's beyond my control. I want to go back because I, I, I've heard you know several point, important points have been raised. Janet was talking about experiencers, and so mm -hmm. the, the experiencers and multi dimensions of experience. The experiencers are unique in some ways, and also they're like everybody else from this from a practical uh, counseling perspective. And what I want to emphasize is that in terms of human experience and its multi layers and dimensions and you know special niches uh, that that all of this could be related to a wheel with multiple spokes and that the counselor's duty is to is to bring the participant to the hub of the wheel where the slightest mm. the slightest uh, you know recalibration may produce a pr profound result on the performance at its perimeter rather than spending our time on the perimeter of the wheel and traveling the you know its circumference we we want to follow the the threads into the center and what we begin to discover is that many of the issues are interrelated that you know again my mm -hmm. hypothetical example that with the relationship with the father that may be, it may, the, the, the character of that relationship may express itself in, in work. It may express itself in, you know, personal goals. It may express itself in physical health. You know, three different arenas, let's say. Mm -hmm. but, if yeah. we, but all of them like, are like spokes on this wheel. And when we get to the hub, instead of having to try to work, you know, and expend a lot of energy on each individual issue, if we can get to the, the, the key issues, and, and, and transform it at those places, then on all these different levels, uh, the, that change will, look, will be expressed. So the, the goal of the practitioner is, is to get to the heart, to the root, to the core, to the center, and, and, to, and, and to facilitate a recalibration at that center place, because just the slightest, uh, you know, the, just the slightest change at, 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 a, at a key location will result in uh, profound reflections across the board in, in, in all these other areas. Does this help with the implanted memories, the, the brain mind wipes that they have, the, um, you know, those things that are intentionally uh, put in there by either the extraterrestrials or the government? You know, there's people with false memories, they get their minds wiped, they, they're missing time. Um, I ha I've worked with a client whose whole life before he was um, awakened in the lab was uh, an imprint, an, uh, an implant, all the memories, and a lot of the super soldiers are having those type of things. I'm just wondering if there's subconscious words that are coming out behind those these scenarios when you're talking to them about something, anything, might be the keys that'll help them unlock these um, these memories that are behind all these other walls that are 
been artificially put in there. I mean, we, we have all these things that are repressed by normal trauma, but then you have the accelerated program of the government and the extraterrestrials. How do you work with those things? Well, I think what you're talking about speaks to these fundamental ideas uh, related to dissociation under trauma, you know, the, what with, with, with the common understanding being that the, the MK Ultra program, which was pioneered in Canada, you know, McGill University did a lot of the research for the Kubarik torture manual in the 1950s. And there was a lawsuit by the survivors against the federal government here for colluding with the CIA to torture those wow. people. Wow. Uh, it's written up at the McG the McGill University student newspaper has a fine article. Uh, you c you can find it on the McGill University website. Uh, but uh, to go back to this idea that dissociation via trauma is, you know, is considered a a means of partitioning the personality of the or the mind of mm -hmm. the, the victim. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm performing here is an integrative work. What I've emphasized is a, a journey to the center a reintegration and again I don't dictate outcomes what that reintegration will look like but I say that irrespective of the influence whether it be you know family of origin or extraterrestrial irrespective that the human mechanism uh, the psychological emotional mechanism that makes us human that is common amongst all of us that responds to acoustic stimuli in the way that the yogis respond to mantra that 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 it's func it will function uh, in any of these environments, and the only differentiators at, at that point would come down to, the, you know, the competence or abilities of the practitioner, or the chemistry between the practitioner and the participant. As I said, not every news story is for John Kelly here. It's my job just to find out, you know, what I'm supposed to be working with, where I can make progress, and the same with clients. I, I, my goal is really just to find the people who can succeed with me, and work with those people. Uh, I, 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 I can't yeah. say that, you know, I can't guarantee that I will be able to work with everybody, but using the same procedure, it's possible that others such as yourselves could, could, bring, uh, could bring help, uh, you know, further help to the people who are seeking. Yeah, oh, easily, you know, what, I, what I hear is, you know, is there are resonances, uh, whatever is going on between you and I now will have resonances with our family of origin, our past life imagery, our future life imagery, and we have fractals. Ultimately, all the subpersonalities have at their core is, is our universal archetypes, which are ultimately a fractals of the creator of all, or at least that's an interesting way to look at it. So, so again, the, the, this this common the the array of consciousness as it occurs within the personality, and the differentiation that manifests through experience, and uh, you know the different desires that we bring, the karma that we bring to this lifetime, and, and the the locations in the body where those complexes reside, where, where mm -hmm. the where the the condition of the chakras become, offers a parallel to the psychological concept of the, co the complex. Mm -hmm. That, mm -hmm. the, that the chakra is an acoustic entity and that the vritti mm -hmm. that accompany each chakra, the petals that surround each of the points are harmonic, are like the harmonic overtones that accompany the fundamental tones of, of music in Pythagorean study. The harmonic, overtones, wow. the harmonic overtones are the higher frequency tones that accompany the root, the root sounds. Uh, so, so the emotions, the vridis are the emotions in, 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 a, in simple, you know, cultural exchange. The vridis are the emotions and where those complexes occur are indicated by the participants reporting upon bombardment with those sound waves. They will say, I am feeling this feeling. And I ask, where are you feeling the feeling? And they will say, I am feeling it, uh, you know, it, 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 at, at the solar plexus. I am feeling the feeling in my throat I am you know like that and it's like the, without with, without me having to you know indoctrinate them into yoga physiology people volunteer right. this uh, uh, so we work by working with that kind of reporting we trace the feeling to its origin and that the client is facilitated to utilize their inner dimensional capability uh, and it's really quite profound because with the acoustic stimulus the clients who are some of them who are non-visual like they don't dream visually and such, they, they report they have powerful visual experiences that, are, that arise in that facilitation. The, the, 
counselor creates a, a scenario where they can do that walk through the field <laughs> of fire and that all of that is adding up you know everyone's playing their part the participant is bringing all that potential and the facilitator is bringing all of this skill and insight and together this this walk to the inner child the place of integration is occurring and all the magic f is following the, the facilitator isn't telling them you know see this or feel that the, right. It's all manifesting spontaneously together, and that could only happen, you know, in conditions where there's good harmony you know, to begin with, right? That that the right people are yeah. in the right place at the right time together, because that, that each of them is is facilitating the best result from each other. So it's all it's all of this is very personal. As I say, I I will never work with all eight billion people on the planet, but if I can right. if I can work yes. with the people who who will get the best result from working with me, then I will have done my duty. Okay, so I have a, two, two experiments for you. One is uh, like if two people were talking to each other and it wasn't just one person you were hearing, but you were hearing an interchange between a couple. That would be a really interesting thing to hear on one level. The other one is if you took a neutral, uh, like in in, uh, in the kind of uh, yoga that we teach, uh, there's a series of different sounds, lam, vam, ram, yam, ham, om, uh, in each of the chakras, and you have everybody make the same sounds. Lam, vam, ram, yam, um, oh, belly hold, pelvis hold, send the kundalini up. Anyway, you could, if you had a series of sounds like that, which correspond, especially if you give the induction beforehand, these are the sounds re respectively for each of the chakras. I bet you, you could, you'll have this universal way of comparing everybody, the different data you get from different people and different reactions. I think that would be really interesting. Certainly, there's opportunity for this type of study. Absolutely, with the with the tantric, uh, you know, roots sounds as you d described uh -huh. and and their accompanying vridis uh, but in terms of couples work the model that i followed is that i i work with each participant individually and then in a third mm -hmm. session i bring the, the couple meets with me and that we ex together explore the material that arose in the individual sessions terrific that's so, great so, i know you sent a couple more recordings you want to play another one uh, yeah so, do I, I, I'm trying to remember what I've said. Do we have one over there that says lesson in, in it? No, you got one that's uh, no. Carrie and then uh, you fear. Fear. Okay, let's go, to the, let's go to the fear one. Let's listen to the, the forward part. All right, take me a second. I got to change things. This is great. We're getting training lessons from you, John. I love it. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's all happening in real time, guys. To her one day, you're my yeah. mother, even though you didn't born me. You and the beer, the memory. Okay, pause. You and the beer, the memory. You. Yeah, very good. I, I, it's such an incredibly short clip. So we're hearing a client talking about the relationship with their mother, and I reported to them. I said, I heard the words, "You only fear the memory," and we'll just just roll that one more time. Memory on the fear of the memory on the fear of the memory. You know, be scared, do it. Uh, only fear the memory is a very interesting comment because it talks wow. it talks about emotions, fear, and it talks about uh, psychic material, memories, and it, it portrays it portrays the 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 subject of of the fear as a psychic entity not as a you know real time real world phenomena but as, as as something that resides within their mind and that and that working with the contents of their mind appears to offer a path to overcoming the fear wow it, it, the voice is very affirmative it diminishes the the fear it doesn't say the fear is unmanageable or uh, we can't overcome this fear it's so awful it, it diminishes and says, you only fear the memory. That's all it is. The, the voice is very reassuring. It's very affirmative. It, it speaks, for, it's a voice of strength and self-confidence. We want to integrate with mm -hmm. that self-confident inner person because we want to exercise that strength in our everyday world and be of service to, 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 to support others through great strength. <coughs> wow. Great. Um, then there was one more. Okay, so... This one more is another newsmaker clip, and it's John Kerry. And this is this goes back to deep state. Oh. Deep state being so topical these days, I have no oh. idea why. And I'm covering, <laughs> I'm covering the Maidan incident in Ukraine, a major regime change uh, 
uh, endeavor that's, you know, we're still, they're still in the swamp over there. You know, it's, it, that society's in chaos. They went through a, yeah. they went through a coup. They threw out their democratically elected officials and they replaced them with a new government. And they're still trying to figure out how they're going to make things work. A lot of problems around this. It was a very important story for me to look at. So I, I, I studied many of the speakers, including John Kerry, who went to the Ukraine to speak to the, to the parliament. And this is his speech. This is, this is, you know, the story is from a few years back, but it, it's significant for, in terms of our fact finding discussion. So let's listen to John Kerry, what he said. It was very moving, and it gave me a deep personal sense of how closely linked the people of Ukraine are to not just Americans, but to people all across the world who today are asking for their rights, asking for the privilege to be able to live, defining their own nation, defining their futures. Pause. Okay, this is John Kerry in his role as Secretary of State of the United States. John Kerry, the Vietnam War veteran, who upon his return to the United States in the early 1970s became an outspoken public figure in an anti-war peace campaign. Uh, Vietnam War uh, was a, a battlefield of multi-dimensions. The message I heard him say that I'm pointing out here today is, are the words scary, the phoenix sat up. So let's listen to that. That's what this is about. Scary, the phoenix sat up. Scary, the phoenix sat up. Scary, the phoenix sat up. Okay. The phoenix sat up. Well, this is very interesting. You know, phoenix being uh, a, a, a city in Arizona. Mm -hmm. Phoenix being a, a mythical bird that you know consumes itself and is reborn in, in in Western mysticism. Phoenix being a CIA assassination program that was implemented during the Vietnam War, a counterinsurgency assassination program. I reported this. I reported this story. In 2013, I believe, the links, Janet has prepared all these links and put them up on the Aquarian radio page so people can consult the articles and see the timestamps. I reported this 2013, and in 2017, the beginning of this year, The Intercept reported as well. I said that John Kerry's message indicated a revived CIA Phoenix program. That was my finding and my deliberation based on that finding in 2013. And The Intercept, which is the repository of Edward Snowden's NSA cash, which is you know a very prominent whistleblower newspaper, they reported it three years later. They said the CIA Phoenix program was back on track. They brought it back. Well, that's, that's really... Uh, you know, really beating the clock. You know, if, yeah. if, if we if we accept if we accept the notion as yogis that Krishna manifested as great time or Mahakala in his Vishva Rupa mm -hmm. form on the battlefield, if we mm -hmm. accept that time is a person in that construct, then here we we see that the the bondages of time are, are liberated from my work in such a way that. Uh, I'm outperforming the most prominent whistleblowers of our day, the most famous whistleblowers, Snowden's names attached to The Intercept. These people are far more well-known than I am, but I'm outperforming them uh, in, in the factual, real-world way. My intelligence on the CIA Phoenix program was, was revealed three years prior to its publication. Either The Intercept sat on the story, or I, I, I had special arrangements with time itself that facilitated with grace that I could consistently uh, you know, f detect and report information that would be proved factual after the fact. Uh, time is personal. That's, that's the notion that Krishna yeah. was conveying. Time and consciousness are personal. You guys already know all about that. But my work, I think, speaks to that in as much as we're, we're reporting yeah. the future. So what do you hear from the Donald? Have you heard, <laughs> how could you avoid listening to him? Well, it was a very important issue because I've been covering presidential inaugurations since 2001, and there was considerable expectation upon me by society to continue in this reporting. You know, during the 2004 campaign, presidential campaigns, I was uh, participating in 10 panel interviews a day 
day after day <laughs> because the demand for this coverage wow. was so great. And so I've, with that you know, precedent in mind, I, 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 I came to some conclusions, many of which were not very popular, uh, about the current state of affairs in the United States. The, you know, the popular president, Donald Trump, has been elected, there's no doubt. Uh, but there are significant controversies that have attended his uh, first 200 days. And, uh, you know, it's, it's constantly in the news uh, that people are concerned about Russian interference and the relationship with uh, Russia and the, and the Trump campaign. When I studied the president's speech to the CIA, which is like the day after the inauguration, when, I, when the President Trump went to Langley and gave a speech at CIA headquarters, I thought this was a great opportunity to see you know, what, what that environment would stimulate you know, from the mind of the president. And what I heard him say were the words, lie for Russia. I heard the president say this. This is the story's up on newsinsideout.com where I, where I write alongside Alfred Weber. Uh, my story was published uh, January 22nd, 2017. And on February 13th, 2017, Trump National Security Advisor Michael Flynn resigned over reports of non-sanctioned pre-inaugural contact with Russians concerning U.S. sanctions. And it was revealed uh, that, uh, you know, the White House, the White House said uh, openly that they let him go because he lied about Russia. I articulated the reasons for Michael Flynn's dismissal on January 22nd and on February 13th, Michael Flynn was gone. But I believe, you know, Michael Flynn is a tip is a typical tip of the iceberg and that the Russia collusion questions go all the way to the top in this situation. For the president to give such an utterance qualifies him, in my estimation, as a co-participant in events that could not have occurred for, for you know, for someone who had third hand uh, proximity. You know how we talk about separation by degrees? Yeah. I, yeah. I believe that the president uh, is very close to these issues, so close in, that he could articulate it in a way that I could detect it. And again, I beat the clock. Uh, I punched in uh, th three weeks before it became, uh, you know, acknowledged as a fact that lying about Russia was a problem in the, in the Trump White House. You know, how, so time and consciousness are personal. Yeah, the yogi merges, you know, with the supreme. You know, it's all personal. And if the supreme is time, then time is, is within us. Our cosmic potential is time itself. Time is flowing from within us. This construct that we experience is emerging from within us. We all have a part in create as co-creators, you know, as many, many deva, you know, uh, j jiva uh, personalities yep. here. We're all, all of us are all of us are conduits. And this conduit of time manifests through my work, and it, this anticipatory quality speaks to that yoga construct. That may sound far-fetched, but unless somebody could repeat could repeat this performance and, and provide a simpler hypothesis to explain it, that I am satisfied that you know what I'm doing it fulfills these these yogic philosophy ideas. Time is personal; it's not an abstract. We're not looking for time particles. We're not looking for consciousness particles. We're looking for that inner person, that magical inner person within all of us. That cosmic potential is a person, and what that means is, in practical sense, is that our personal our capacity to uh, engage in successful personal relationships with others is entirely related to our success on our spiritual journey that you know if we neglect if we neglect our duty to society and to other people uh, to our families and so on if we turn our backs on these things uh, we we may be mistaken because at the end of the road we may find that the, that uh, you know the cosmic cosmic manifest to us as a person and we need to have successful relationship with a person well if we had learned our personal relationship lessons along the way they would come in very handy if those were the, the that was the case well we're going to have to obviously pick this up another time uh we have like two minutes what well we want is websites and books and everything you advertise yeah. yourself yeah um all right. Last two minutes are yours. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, everybody. It's been great, gracious to, to be with you. I appreciate it so much. My name is John Kelly. My website is yourinnervoice.com. I recently produced a 72-minute independent Canadian feature documentary called UFO Hotline, Secret Messages of the Contactees, where all of the procedures and uh, ideas that I've been discussing today are put into action, where, where callers to my private hotline have disclosed their UFO experiences, and I go looking for the, the deep subconscious material that they disclose 
in the mirror, in the mirror filter their voices. So newsinsideout.com, the link is there on the front page, or my website, yourinnervoice.com, just click there to, to watch the documentary. $5 rental, I think everyone can, can, can handle that. Uh, support, support my work, uh, you know, come to me and, and inquire about sessions, private sessions by telephone or Skype. I work internationally, I have 20 years of practical experience. I've demonstrated today that my findings are vettable and factual, my findings are testable, and that the greatest test will be will occur in the crucible of your own mind when you work with me and you receive that special stimulus that's so customized and personal to you, which are these reflections from your own voice facilitated yeah. by an expert. I hope you'll, you'll in, in, take me up on that offer. Yourinnervoice.com. It's been great to be with you, Janet and Dr. Sasha. Thank you again. My UFO experience happened when I was in the military in uh, 1988. Uh, me and another guy, we was on patrol. I was in the U.S. Air Force at that time, and um, we was on patrol in Panama, Panama City, Panama, the one in Central America, and um, we was on patrol and we seen uh, this uh, object in the sky. I think that the testimony is rich and loaded in additional hidden language that manifests through this procedure that we detected additional insight into the testimony of this UFO witness. There is additional testimony that tell, appears to me to tell a story of perceptions of extraterrestrials, perceptions of, of uh, perceptions of symbols, 